Dr. Chris has helped many patients achieve physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being. She has completed three books on mental health, Beyond the Label is one of those, which we will be talking about today, as well as a 10-week course in in-person retreat on mental health. You can learn more about Dr. Bjorndal at drchristinabjorndal.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I will just dive in. So today we're going to talk about bipolar disorder and I'm going to go into a little bit about my story and then share my philosophy of, of how I work with patients. So I am a naturopathic doctor and just for the benefit of people who you know, may not know what that is, I just want to explain that we are trained like medical doctors in terms of the sciences. So we dissect cadavers, we study pharmacology, but we don't use drugs to treat. And instead, what we are trained in is what I consider the natural, or, or I don't even like using the word alternative, but I will just say natural modalities, which include diet, nutrition, supplementation, botanical medicine, homeopathy, traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture, counseling, hydrotherapy, and we're also trained in massage and chiropractic medicine. We are guided by the principles of first, we don't want to do any harm to our patients. We want to use the healing power of nature and ultimately try to address the root of a problem. We look at each person as an individual. So we are, are more interested in you and what makes you tick and, and, and who you are and your experience as a human, uh, then we are in necessarily the disease that might have you. We are, our goal really is to promote health and to prevent health conditions. And lastly, we are, the, the Latin derivation of the word doctor is the word docere, which means doctor as teacher. Now, I have added this last principle here, and it's not a, a core principle in the naturopathic field, but I feel this is a really important piece, which is physician heal thyself. I really feel that unless, um, you know, you, you can only take somebody or help somebody as far as you've actually been able to help yourself. So this is really I think one of the reasons that I um, that differentiates me from many of the clinicians because I have this lived experience piece, which I'll go into. So I am a, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, I'm a friend, I'm a colleague, I'm a, I'm a naturopathic doctor, as I've mentioned. And these are all the roles that I play. And when I work with patients, or when you're listening you know, to me now, I want you to think about all the roles that you play in your life. And I want you to consider if there are any roles that might not be serving you. Because here's the thing, we have to bear in mind the oxygen mask theory. Many people are giving from a place of emptiness, and it's really important to put your oxygen mask on first before we are giving to others. What happens often is we end up very depleted and we become out of balance in life and this creates more stress for people. So just bear in mind and think about all the roles that you play. Now I'm also a speaker. I also have additional training in counseling with five types of therapy that I use with patients. So compassion-focused therapy, gestalt psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness-based therapy, and integrative reprogramming technique. And I'm the author of three books, and today we're going to be talking mostly about Beyond the Label. So I haven't always been a naturopathic doctor, and one of the questions that we ask patients is when 
did your problems start? And when I get asked that question, I, I, I actually go back to when I was in utero because I'm, I'm adopted and I open my book with a discussion about how the neurological and emotional wiring happens when you're in utero. So the emotional and mental state of your mother results in important biological imprinting. So Dr. Gabor Mate, who is the author of several books, one of which is called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction, he pointed out that the important point to explore here is how stresses during pregnancy can alter or be already begin to program or predisposition an individual to mental health concerns. And this helps to explain the well-known fact that adopted children are at greater risks for all kinds of problems that predispose to addictions. So in my case, the stress on the mother results in higher levels of cortisol reaching the baby. And this can create some challenges to brain structures during rapid brain development, which happens in utero. And there's, this is research that is quoted in Dr. Gabor Mate's book. So if people are interested, they can look that up further. So I, I think that when I came into the world, I was already wired to be sensitive and anxious and predisposed to some mental health challenges. Thankfully, I was adopted into a very loving home. And for the most part, my childhood was was um, uh, you know, stable and calm. But I did develop some core beliefs as a result of learning that I was adopted. And so many people have core beliefs that are driving them. And I'll talk a little bit more about this. But what I want you to understand is, and these can be conscious, so you can have awareness of them, or they can be in your unconscious mind. And these beliefs drive our behavior and how we operate in the world. And so for myself, because I felt that I was unworthy, I became an overachiever. So I was the child that was winning the awards, was a top athlete, top student. And I, but underneath that behavior were these beliefs. And as you read the, these, I want you to think about what might be some beliefs that you have about yourself? You can have positive core beliefs too, but, for my, but mine were mostly on the negative side. So when I got to junior high, I developed an eating disorder. And this started pretty innocently. I, what had happened was I went uh, after school to a friend's house and we gorged out on junk food. And then shortly thereafter, I heard her purging in the bathroom. And this was really alarming to me. So I naturally asked her, is she, if she, was she okay? What was happening? Was she sick? And she said to me that this is something that she did to, so that she didn't, wouldn't gain weight and kind of implied that I might want to consider doing that too. And so my you know, this was a very innocent comment that packed a lot of punch for me. I was an impressionable teenager. I was pretty insecure at that time. And so I started engaging in that behavior. But I do want to point out an interesting note. The year prior to that, I did antibiotics to treat acne. And there's been a lot of research and discussion in the media over these last few years about the relationship between the gut and the brain. So this was just one study where they compared subjects who received the placebo intervention versus participants who received a multi-species probiotic. And it showed that they had significantly reduced ruminating thoughts, which is one of the most predictive habits in depressive episodes. So 
when they were given the probiotic, they, these patients became less focused on recurrent bad feelings. So just a little side note, and I'll come back to this later in the presentation, but I, I do want to mention that because there is a gut-brain relationship. So then what happened for me is I continued on, I went to university, continued my overachieving behavior, and then in my third year, I, I, hit, I hit a wall. Basically, I found myself in a place that I'd never been before, which was riddled with anxiety and suicidal thoughts and plagued with just overwhelming fatigue and just a sense of just, just that I, I, basically I was depressed, but I didn't know that that's what I was experiencing because I had no context to put or frame of reference for that. I had never known anybody who was depressed and I only understood depression in the economic sense of the word. And so out of concern for me, one of my friends uh, spoke to the UBC, I went to the University of British Columbia. They sp spoke to the UBC student services and the health services and they were, she was advised to make an appointment for me. So. I went to this appointment, I was prescribed an antidepressant, diagnosed with depression and anxiety. I started this antidepressant, it was a tricyclic class of antidepressants. Antidepressants. This was in the uh, mid 1980s, or late, mid to late 1980s. And a few months later, I spun into a, a, a week of little to no sleep. I had a, a basically a full-blown delusional psychotic manic episode. It took two police officers, two paramedics, my mom and my boyfriend at the time, uh, to wrestle me into a straitjacket and off I went to the hospital where I was injected with Halperidol, a powerful antipsychotic, and left in a rubber room to come back to reality. And when I came back to reality, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder type one. And what I did with that was I basically stuffed it in a corner where I dared not to look. I did not like the label. I had a hard time accepting it. I still was, wasn't comfortable with the previous labels of anxiety or depression. And I just basically uh, continued to motor through my life and did not want anybody to know about what had happened to me or that I was been given that diagnosis. I graduated, I was a valedictorian of my graduating class, I ended up working, climbed that corporate ladder within six years, reported to a CEO. Again, continuing this overachieving behavior, but all the while wearing the mask that I'm okay on the outside, but actually I'm not doing very well on the inside. But I was operating with the persona that, that I've got it all together, and you're never gonna see me sweat. But eventually I was, basically the, the decade of uh, 1990 to 2000 was mania free for me, but I was riddled with anxiety and depression for most of that time. And I had a suicide attempt in 1994, which left me in a coma on, uh, with kidney failure. Uh, I was, when I came out of the coma, I was told I would need a kidney transplant. I was on dialysis. And I really was not impressed that I was still here. And, you know, when you're at the bottom, really the only place you have to go is up. That was really the only place that was left for me was to, move, to go up. And this same friend that had made that appointment for me gave me a book to read called A Return to Love. And there was a discussion about, there was a study done in these this groups of AIDS patients. And basically they, the, the, there was the group, there was two groups. And the first group, they loved and accepted themselves. They were supported by their community and their family. And the other group was not. They were shunned from their community and family because of their being homosexual. And they studied the prognosis and outcome of these two groups. And not surprisingly, the group that had the positive 
support did better than the group that didn't. And the light bulb that went off in my head upon reading about this was, I didn't love and accept myself at all. I had been fighting myself all of this time. I did not want anybody to know, again, that I was bipolar. I was told to never disclose this to anybody by my psychiatrist in, in the workforce. And I was, I stumbled upon this quote in the book, A Return to Love, which goes like this. Surrender means the decision to stop fighting the world and to start loving it instead. It is a gentle liberation from pain. But liberation isn't about breaking out of anything. It's a gentle melting into who we really are. So we let down our armor and we discover the strength of our Christ self. So we're simply asked to shift focus and take on a more gentle perception. Just that's all God needs, just one sincere surrendered moment when love matters more than anything and we know that nothing else really matters at all so i had my moment of surrender and i decided from that point on that I was going to figure out how to love and accept myself. Remember, I was being driven by these core beliefs that I wasn't worthy, that I didn't matter, that I was a mistake, that I wasn't good enough. And I had to reframe all of that. But that's... So when I, so what happened was shortly after this moment of surrender, my kidneys made a recovery. My nephrologist said that I'm a walking miracle. I don't know if that's true, but all I know is I was never, never knew I would be so happy that I could actually go to the bathroom and urinate. I mean, we all take for granted these things, but believe me, when you don't have that ability, you realize how important it is. So. Where did I go from there? I started to see a naturopathic doctor and I started group therapy at the advice uh, of my psychiatrist. And then I also did one-on-one -on -one therapy. And I ended up going to a mental health regained public forum. This is in 1999 and it was put on by the, it's called the Canadian Society of Orthomolecular Medicine. And I learned about nutrition and diet from this doctor who was speaking, and his name was Dr. Abram Hoffer. And I went to, I, I got a referral to go and see him, and I started taking his prescription, along with the psychotropic medication that I was on. And I'm gonna add here that I am not anti-medicine, anti-pharmaceuticals, but I am minimum dose for maximum benefit, for perhaps the shortest, shortest duration of time. And I want people to understand that this is not about this or that form of medicine. This is about this and that form of medicine. So I believe that I am alive today because of pharmaceutical Western psychiatric medicine, but I thrive in my life because of naturopathic medicine. At one point, I was taking five psychotropic meds at one time. And the point I'd also like to make is we do not study these medications in a polypharmacy format as they are prescribed in the field. But we study them in isolation. But that is not how they're used in the field. And what's important to understand is the side effects from these medications can be crippling, just as crippling as the condition that you're trying to treat. So for myself, I started taking... Um, Dr. Hoffer's protocol. Now, Dr. Hoffer was a nutritionally oriented psychiatrist, and he practiced what's called orthomolecular medicine. And this term was coined by Dr. Linus, Linus Pauling, who won two Nobel Prizes. I mean, I think that is 
completely remarkable to win one in your lifetime, and he won two. The goal of orthomolecular medicine is to restore the optimum environment of the body by correcting molecular imbalances on the basis of individual biochemistry. So Dr. Uh, Linus Pauling said, nearly all disease can be traced to a nutritional deficiency. And Dr. Hoffer, oh, I didn't put that quote in by Dr. Hoffer. So Dr. Hoffer uh, also said that he felt that this, the same, uh, he felt the same way and that tranquilizers and benzodiazepines really just made for a better uh, behaved patient that became chronically dependent on such medications. And so this is why these two men were very much about wanting to look at what the root cause may be for, for people. So I started this protocol and like I said, I carried it along with my medication and I did this for a, a, a year. And I had the first year where I was free from depression and anxiety, which I had not experienced for the 15 years prior to that. Now I had a lot of stress in my life. I had a, I had a, a pretty high, a high achieving job, and I am a, I'm a, I will acknowledge that I was or am a workaholic. And uh, at one point, I ended up asking the question: If money didn't matter, what would I be doing? And I sat with that question for many, like a long, many years actually. And the answer that came up for me was to go back to school and become a naturopathic doctor. I considered becoming a medical doctor, but I did not want to endure the sleepless nights. And I don't think that's good for somebody with bipolar disorder. So I went to back to high school at 33 and then on to university again, and then to the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine with the sole intent for one purpose only. And this is to help people regain their mental health the way that I had help, been helped. When I went to see Dr. Hoffer, he was 80 years old. So I knew that he, at that time, seemed to be the only person in, in the country that was helping people. And I, I thought that, that I would like to follow in his footsteps. And so now here I am. So these are just some statistics, and I'm Canadian, so I have Canadian statistics. So one in five Canadians will experience a mental illness. And the rates have been increasing here for, the, for this, uh, these medical conditions. They are not on the decline, they are on the rise. And within a generation, it's expected that almost 9 million Canadians will be living with mental illness. And so by the year 2030, a person will commit suicide globally every second. Now that is a startling statistic, and that was Dr. James Greenblatt, who's an integrative psychiatrist, said that, and I feel there's a silent epidemic going on. And I would like to be part of the solution here to help people understand that they do not need to suffer in silence. And I would like to change this, this statistic. So the way I work with patients is, and what I explain in my book, is that there's four areas that make up us as human beings. We have the physical, the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual. Our Western system is focused on the physical. So if that's what we're gonna focus on, what you need to understand is there's three macro systems within you. You have your neurotransmitters, your endocrine system, and your organs of detoxification. And all these macro systems are working together in the one vessel that is your body, in the one container. There's not silos set up here. They are all communicating with each other. So in terms of the neurotransmitters, we have serotonin and GABA that are considered inhibitory. There's excitatory neurotransmitters, glutamine, norepinephrine, dopamine, acetylcholine, and there's also epinephrine. And in terms of our hormonal system, this, ref this consists of the following glands in your body, the hypothalamus pituitary, the thyroid, ovaries in women, testes in men, and the adrenal glands. 
And what I want you to understand is these glands produce hormones. And the main hormones that people are aware of are estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, DHEA, and the thyroid hormone. What I want you to understand here is that imbalances in every single hormone have mental health symptoms. This is estrogen, and I'm going to go through these quickly just in the interest of time, but I'll be sharing these slides so you'll have access to them. So every hormone you can see here has something to do with mental health. So, and the last macro system to bear in mind is the organs of detoxification. These consist of your liver, kidneys, colon, lungs, skin, and lymphatic system. When these organs of detoxification are not working optimally, it contributes to this concept that people hear about, which is inflammation or the idea of the brain on fire. So the areas that I think that are important to address to support those three macro systems are the foundation of health, diet, sleep, exercise, and managing stress. So when I say those four, I want you to think about if there's anything that you need to work on of those four. That's the foundation of your health house, so to speak. And that's where I started, right? I started with the nutrition. I didn't even start with diet. I started with supplements. <laughs> and then I worked on managing stress. But the next areas that I think we have to work on, and this is eventually what happened to me. Eventually, I continued to bump up against those core beliefs. So I had to work on my thoughts and my emotions and how I behaved and reacted in the world and the environment. Now, when I speak about the environment, I speak of it from three perspectives, the quality of the air, food, and water. Traditionally, the Western medicine viewpoint about de uh, depression and anxiety is often that it's a deficiency picture, that you are not making enough serotonin, therefore you need a uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor form of medication so that we can allow for more serotonin to get across that synaptic cleft and bind to that other um, neuron and fire properly. And that might be the case. But what if that's not the case? What if it's not a deficiency problem? What if it's a blockage problem, that there's something from the environment blocking the receptors, and therefore the serotonin is having a hard time getting in the door? And that's what we look at in naturopathic medicine. The second concept with the environment is the idea of epigenetics. So what this means, and, and this is the thing, whenever I asked my psychiatrist, why is this happening to me? He would say, well, it's genetic, Chris. And I would say, but I'm adopted. So how do you know that that's true? I can't even, I can't verify the truth of that statement because I cannot look to my right or my left to prove that to be true. So I never adopted that as the truth. And instead, I continue to look for answers or explanations as to why. And I feel that this is a big contentious issue because this is the party line for most people who are diagnosed with bipolar disorder, that they are told it's genetic. And what I think that does is it makes you feel like you're a victim, that there's nothing that you can do to help yourself. And so you don't actually do anything to help yourself. And that you stay on. So I subscribe to the theory, or I'm open to this idea of epigenetics, which is genes load the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. So yes, your genes predispose you to a medical condition, but it's the epigenetics that predetermine the outcome, that turn the gene on or off. And this is based on the work of Bruce Lipton in the, his book called The Biology of Belief. The third concept with respect to the environment is this idea of neuroplasticity. This is based by, on the work of Dr. Norman Doidge, a Canadian psychiatrist who wrote a book called The Brain That Changes Itself. So what he 
discovered is that you can create new neural pathways. Your brain has a bendy or plastic quality to it. So you are not fixed in any way, shape, or form. You can change. You can create new neural pathways. The last area with respect to the 10 steps that I talk about in Beyond the Label is love, compassion, spirituality. So I ask every patient on a scale of one to 10, how do you love yourself? And I want you to think about that for yourself right now. On a scale of one to 10, how much do you love yourself? And many people answer very low. And to me, this is where we need to be starting. Like I said, when I came out of that suicide attempt, not a happy camper. I was really upset that that did not work. But yet, I had to go somewhere. I basically threw my hands up in the air and said, okay, I give up. Okay, I'm going to, I got to figure out a better way because the way I'm, I've been doing this life is not working for me. And I'm, I've got to find another way. And I had to figure out how to love myself. So this is really what I think is really, really important and a key piece that's missing. And I think in the Western conversation of medicine that happens in the psychiatric offices. So I'm going to move through this pretty quick because we have talked about me coming back to do a, a lecture just on diet alone. So I'll just hit some highlights here. So diet, we're wanting to support the formation of neurotransmitters, hormones, and, and elimination and detoxification. So understand that everything you put in your body informs your body. And I'm going to add here as well, on your body. So food affects brain function. And the neurotransmitters and hormones are derived from food. So these are some common analogies that you probably you may have heard. So garbage in, garbage out. You are what you eat. And actually, I'll add, you are what you eat and you don't excrete. And the car won't run if you don't put the right fuel in the tank. So some of the reasons to be open to for why mental illness can happen are maybe you're missing essential nutrients or cofactors to form the neurotransmitters or hormones. Chronic elevation of stress hormones like cortisol can increase quinolinic acid and contribute to more depression. And also Dr. Hoffer had an adrenochrome hypothesis around psychosis, which I not sure if I included this in this lecture, but I'll, we'll see. And if, if not, I'll, maybe somebody can remind me and I'll, and I'll explain that. But basically, um, we, we have, th there's a relationship between psychosis and, and, um, and the stress hormones. I've, I've talked about receptors being blocked. We've talked about perhaps it can be, again, we focus on serotonin a lot, but maybe it's, maybe it's dopamine. Maybe it's thyroid. So, and then this idea about dysbiosis or an imbalance in the gut bacteria. When I lecture, I in uh, in group, you know, in front of a group of people, I ask people to put up their hand if they've never taken an antibiotic, and never once has somebody put their hand up. So most of us have taken antibiotics. And again, I'm not saying that that's completely a bad thing. Yes, you might need to take an antibiotic, absolutely. But it does destroy all the good bacteria as well as the bad guys. And what tends to come back first after you take an antibiotic is opportunistic pathogens like candida, yeast. I can't tell you how many yeast infections and urinary tract infections I had following um, taking antibiotics. So it creates an imbalance. And so we wanna restore that balance by adding back in the good bacteria. Now this is a chart um, that the, the, the highlight here I want you to understand is that tryptophan is an essential amino acid. So what that means is you cannot make it. The current version of the human being just cannot make 
tryptophan. And this is important because tryptophan goes on to make serotonin. SSRI medications work at the point at the green at the green lettering where I have serotonin here. That's the point in the pathway that the SSRI medication works. But from a root cause, we want to look at the very beginning of this pathway back to tryptophan. And we also want to understand that tryptophan, when it comes in the body, is going to go in one of three directions. First and foremost, it is going to be converted in the liver to niacin. And that's because niacin is used in every single cell of our body to create something called ATP or adenosine triphosphate, which is the energy currency that every single cell in your body needs. So it's more important for your heart to be beating and for your lungs to be breathing than it is for you to feel good. The other important point about this pathway to understand is that if you are under a lot of stress, then tryptophan is going to get shunted to the red quinolinic acid via another pathway in the body called the kyanaric pathway, and you're going to be stealing that tryptophan away from making serotonin. The third point to understand here is that you need these nutritional cofactors to make it from tryptophan all the way to serotonin. And if you don't have them, you won't get there. And this is what Dr. Hoffer started me on. He started me on nutrients that supported this. Not tryptophan. Not tryptophan, but B3 and these nutrients. And I do not want people running out and starting to take these things. I want people to be working with a physician who understands this and they can support you in this regard. This is the GABA pathway. And I want you to understand that the similar cofactors are required, the zinc and B6, just another chart showing that, and then you've got your dopamine pathway, same cofactors are involved. The other important point to note about the dopamine pathway is that phenylalanine is another essential amino acid. So the, about another book I wrote is called The Essential Diet. I think there's a lot of confusion out there about what to eat and people really have to understand that there's these essential nutrients that you have to be uh, making sure that you're getting. And if you're not getting them, you're not, it's going to be difficult to support this neurotransmitter formation. This is a, showing you our plates. So a lot of times what people are actually eating is more, mostly protein, very little vegetables and, and heavy on refined carbs. But ideally, we need to be having mostly vegetables and, and adding in some protein and, and balancing it with complex carbs. So I'm going to skip through these. You have, you'll have, have access to them. Just because of the time, I want to get to some of the other areas. But I do want to mention with respect to supplements that it's best to be working with someone who understands this. And there's a few problems with supplements. People are taking either the wrong dose, they're taking the wrong form of a nutrient, or there's non-medicinal ingredients that aren't beneficial, or there's problems with their gut because of the dysbiosis. And so we want to make sure that we're doing things properly. So these again go through the correct forms. And I will note again with niacin that it's something that needs to be supervised. It causes a flush reaction in people and it can be uncomfortable. And so again, please be working with somebody. These are all the essential nutrients that are required. And so I put this in because when you start questioning and start having some education around what is health, a simple piece of bread and, and, a, and fish can be complicated. You know, somebody who's vegan or has that fish been tested for mercury and is that bread gluten-free? So it can, can get a little bit complicated. But what I like people to do is just focus on real food, shopping around the perimeter of the store. I also want people to understand that digestion is a, a parasympathetic process in the body. So what that means is you have two branches to your nervous system. Think sympathetic for stress or stress and parasympathetic or relaxed. And a lot of people spend a lot of fo 
put a lot of focus on eating the right foods and that's great. But if you're stressed while you're doing, while you're eating, it may be for naught. So it's really important to understand that, that we need to be in a more relaxed state when we're eating. So this is how I feel. I'm moving into the next step here, which is sleep. So this is how I feel when I'm, I haven't had a good sleep. And so I just want to mention here that this is, again, one of the foundational principles of health. And we're really compromising, I think, our sleep quality in, in our modern age with our computers and our iPhones and our iPads and social media. And if you take anything from this conversation today, please do your best to not go on social media or computers within two hours of going to sleep. And do your best to prep to, to protect your sleep. Uh, for bipolar disorder, this is fundamental for me. Um, and I think for all of my patients that I work with sleep, we have to make sure we're getting it. And which, what I want you to understand is there's an inverse relationship between cortisol, which is an adrenal hormone, and melatonin, which is the sleep hormone. So if you are triggered in the evening by, say, you know, uh, uh, so, uh, an upsetting news piece, for example, or something that catches your eye on social media that's upsetting, that can spike cortisol levels at a time when melatonin is trying to rise and it can, sleep can escape you. So it's really important to understand that. And also there's the blue light issues and the electromagnetic issues when it comes to these devices. Exercise is another foundational principle. Um, and I want to add here, look, I, I get this. I get how hard it is to ask somebody who's depressed to exercise. It's, it's really difficult when you're, when you're depressed to do this, but it's also the medicine that you might need. There's been times for me when the only thing I've accomplished in a day is moving from the door, or sorry, from my bedroom, getting dressed you know, to the door, and that has taken me two, four, six, eight, sometimes 10 hours. That's, that's it. That's all I've done. But I go out and I can tell you this. Never once did I come back feeling worse than when I went out. If I was depressed. So exercise does produce endorphins and enkephalins, which do over time help to elevate your mood. I had a, a suicide attempt uh, actually in 2009, so not that long ago. And what helped me get out of that depression actually was I started to play tennis with one of my friends. And look what, look what that got me. That got me community, got me friendship, it got me outside, sunshine and movement which then stimulated my appetite because when I'm depressed, I don't eat. Don't eat. I don't eat so much so that um, I had a pastor ask me if I was anorexic. And I said to him, no, it's called depression. So I get this, but I also get that it's very beneficial. Now I want to make a caution here on the flip side. Um, I don't, if you're, um, hypomanic or manic, I actually do not recommend that you do vigorous yang type exercise. I actually had a manic episode once happen in the middle of a run. I was just out. I, it was like a completely bizarre, but anyhow, so I now no longer will exercise if I'm ever feeling like I'm heading in the direction of mania. So that's just a caution that I implement. Um, it's been said that the most overutilized prescription for depression and anxiety are pharmaceuticals and the most underutilized is exercise. So these are the benefits of exercising in nature. I'll just skip through this. Now these, this next area is 
I think was really the crux of it and has been the crux of it for me regaining my mental health. So looking at how to manage stress and looking at my thoughts and emotions and how I behave and react in the world. So I was taught a tool called the four R's of working with problematic thoughts and breaking the thought emotion cycle. So this was taught to me by my naturopathic doctor who is a, who I consider also a counselor. But because and so um, I want to give credit to him. So Dr. Jason Hughes, I, because I'm an overachiever, I have upgraded it to the seven R's. So I just, I'm going to go through that really quickly here with you guys. So what this is, is Dr. Hughes was the first person that really taught me, I had done cognitive behavioral therapy, but I really had, a, I, I, I felt that cognitive behavioral therapy for me kept me still stuck in my head with my thoughts, believing most of the negative thoughts that I was thinking. Dr. Hughes taught me that I wanted to recognize my thoughts, but also that we have to refrain from following them by relaxing into the breath. And then we have to repeat this process. And so I'm going to go through these ones step by step. So what I want you to understand is that in our society, most people are living from the neck up. And as a result, we are stuck in a thought emotion cycle. So we have a thought that then triggers an emotion, triggers another thought, triggers another emotion, and we just go round and round. And we can remain stuck in the depression, anxiety, et cetera. And this is where I was stuck. I would have a negative thought. I would have a thought that was not, not positive, and I would follow that thought process through. And what Dr. Hughes taught me is that we need to have a mind, body, spirit approach to how we manage our minds and to consider that no one has ever taught you how to manage your thoughts. So the first step is to bring some awareness to what you are thinking. And if it's along the lines of stinking thinking, then we need to remember and move on to the next step. So in my case, you've probably heard the phrase, you know, the, the glass is half empty or the glass is half full. I wasn't even, I was a, I don't even have a cup. And there's, I mean, forget about whether the cup is half full or half empty. I didn't even, I didn't even feel I had a cup. And that's how negative and how deeply entrenched my negative thoughts were. And what we have to understand is our thoughts create neuropeptides. And these neuropeptides affect the hormones that get produced in our body. So it's a bit of a chicken and an egg problem here. In order to change how we feel, we have to take a look at how we think. Because, our th because of the thoughts creating the neuropeptides. So this is the work of Candace Pert and also Dr. Norman Deutsch. And Candace Pert, she wrote a book called The Molecules of Emotion. And she coined the term psychoneuroimmunology, which is for PNI for short which basically stands for your thoughts can affect the brain and it also affects how you feel. So, so for, for me, I had a really hard time to accepting that my thoughts was uh, created a played a role in my physiology. And I felt like when you, if you had said to me, Chris, change your thoughts, you know, just think positive. I would have rolled my eyes at you and walked out of the room because I felt like when people were saying that to me, I felt like they were saying that I was causing my depression with my thoughts. Now that I'm on the other side of that, I can see how my thoughts affected my physiology. But at the time, I felt like affirmations to me 
was like spraying whipping cream on a pile of baloney. You know, I, I really had a hard time believing that. But I think what I want people to understand is, again, if you understand that your thoughts do affect you know, the neuropeptides that get produced and then the cascade of hormones that ultimately then shifts your physiology and how you feel, then you'll understand this connection that I'm, I'm trying to make here. So if it's too big of a deal for you to go to the positive, then what I would like you to do is just go neutral with your, with your phrases, with your rephrases. So, so Eckhart Tolle has said that the emotions are our body's reaction to thought. The emotion arises at the place where mind and body meet. So the first step is to, I want everyone to start asking themselves, what, what are you thinking? And is this serving you? And if it's not serving you, then please refrain from following those thoughts any further. And the way you refrain or you stop is by breathing, pausing and shifting into the present moment. So your lungs are a big organ and most people are just breathing with the top little bits of their lungs. But your lungs go all the way down to your diaphragm. And when you use your diaphragm to pull down and inflate those lungs, sitting right underneath your diaphragm on top of your kidneys is your adrenal glands. And that it's those adrenal glands that are producing hormones in response to the thoughts that you're thinking. So you are physiologically designed to calm yourself down with the breath. And just to highlight the importance of the breath, I want to, you to understand that if, if anybody's done CPR, there is three things that we do in CPR um, when we find somebody lying comatose on the ground. Two of those three things are dedicated to airway. So we've got two things dedicated to, to first is airway, sorry, dedicated to breathing, I should have said. First is airway, and then breathing, and then we get concerned about whether the heart's moving or not. So to highlight the importance of the breath, what's the first thing we're concerned about when a baby's born? It's not their first heartbeat. It's their first breath. And at the end of our life, what's the, what's the last thing we're waiting for? Not that last heartbeat. It's the last breath. So the breath is the gift of life. And we are born knowing how to breathe. If you watch a baby breathe, they do that belly breathing. But somewhere along the way, we forget how to breathe. And actually, I thought it was really powerful to, to, to know that the Latin derivation of the word inspire, like inspiration, actually means to breathe or put life or spirit into the human body to impart reason to a human soul. So your breath is, is the gift of life here. And most of us are, are not doing it properly. So because I'm, I'm not on the screen here, I will um, just mention that I like people to put the right hand on the belly button. And if you're listening along with me, you can just do this, put your right hand on the belly button and your left hand on your heart. I won't, just because I know we're getting close, if not, I'm probably over time already here. So we'll, I won't go through all the reasons why, but it's all in my book and on these slides. And when you breathe, that right hand's got to move. When you take a proper diaphragmatic breath, it's got, you've got to inflate and it, like inflate into your belly like you're inflating a balloon. And I just want you to understand that there's more serotonin receptors between these two hands between, than there is in your brain. So there's, there's, this is why people gain weight when they go on an antidepressant. So breathing in, and we'll just do a breath here together. So just breathing in to the count of four. So breathing in with me. And then exhaling.
And what I'd like you to do is if you can do one more breath with me, but if you can turn and look out the window, if you have a window or if you have a plant in your room, wherever you're listening, and just look out the window and focus your mind and your eyes on something in nature. And just really look at that. And then we'll just take another breath for together, breathing in for the count of four. So breathing in through your nose. And then out through your mouth or nose. And so while you did that breath, if I was with you and able to hear your answer, I would ask you, was there anything going on in your mind when you took that one breath? And usually I get people to take a couple. And most people turn to me and say, I, like with a look of surprise, and they say, no, there was nothing going on. They look absolutely shocked. And I say to them, this is what we're trying to get to. This is, we're trying to get to this place of peace and relax, like to this shift to the parasympathetic state. And the really interesting, interesting thing is when you breathe in through your nose that way, you're, you're hitting what's called the cella tercica, which houses the hypothalamus and pituitary. So at the beginning of the breath, you're tapping that uh, part of your, your um, hypothalamus, the, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. And when then you're breathing into that belly, extending it out, you're at the other end reaching those adrenals. So it's very powerful and extremely simple. And I like you to direct your focus to something in nature because the mind is a very busy place, a lot going on, give it a job to do, it does the job that you ask it to do. I wanna be clear here that I am not saying that I want you to suppress your thoughts. I am not saying that I want you to deny your thoughts. I'm just saying I want you to catch them and I want you to perhaps push the pause button and, and just stop that thought emotion cycle. So this is how I started. I started, so, so I was pretty suicidal and very anxious when I was taught this by Dr. Hughes. And I, I remember saying to him at the end um, of the session, I said, so that's it? Like, that's all you're, at, you're gonna give me? Like, this is a prescription to go home and practice this? And he says, yes. He said, yes. And I said, well, I'm gonna be doing this all day long. And he said, so be it. And I was. I was catching and redirecting and, and focusing in nature all day long. But I got some insight into my thoughts. I got some insight into um, how I was stuck in a, in a stressed out state. And I got out of depression and anxiety. I mean, we did other things as well, but this was a key thing here. And again, I get it. This is hard to do. I get it. But at this point, I mean, this is free. This costs you nothing. So please do two or three breaths. This costs you maybe 12 seconds, 30 seconds of your time. So I do this when I catch my thoughts. I do this before I eat. And I'm talking about the breathing before I go to bed, before I get out of bed, before I go to the bathroom. Sorry, after I go to the bathroom. Whenever I'm standing around. And when I'm driving, obviously I don't take my hands off the wheel, but I'm present. And this is what this is teaching you. So also anxiety doesn't have a chance to rise in me anymore because I, I'm constantly resetting my nervous system with my breath. So this has taught me to live in the present moment. So what I want you to understand is there's three, three places you can be living in your mind, past, the present, and the future. And as I say that, I want you to think about where do you live most of the time? Are you living in the past? Are you living in the future? Are you living in fear or worry or overwhelm or anxiety of the future? So I was living mostly in the past or the future, but I can tell you what's the only place that really exists in reality. It's the present moment, right? That's all we've got. 
So the prescription is if you are find yourself ruminating about the past, get yourself back to the present moment with the breath. Breath. The past is done. It's over. Can't do anything about it. All you can do is change your relationship to it in the present moment. I have a forgiveness meditation that I can pose for people that I that has helped me a lot uh, let go of the past. And then if you're ruminating about the future, then again, I would say my prescription is affirm a positive outcome because the weight of worry really does affect your health in a negative way. And the future hasn't unfolded. So let's activate what's called the reticular activating system in your brain and get focusing on and, and visualizing what you want to have happen in your life and, have, and see if that unfolds for you. The fourth step here is to resolve to repeat this process. So this is not something you just do once and you're cured, okay? This is something that you've got to train your brain. You're now in brain training. And just like if you wanted to have a toned um, bicep, you're gonna to have to, you gotta lift more than one five pound weight, right? You gotta repeat, repeat, repeat. So, this next step is really cognitive behavioral uh, therapy. So whatever that thought was that you recognize, like it, say it's I am, I am unworthy, then the rephrase would be I am worthy. Now, I, like I mentioned, had a hard time with this, so I would go neutral. So the neutral phrase is I am. And you do not fill in the blank with a descriptive word. You just stay neutral. Neutral is better than negative. You've got to be careful how you talk to yourself because you are always listening to that voice in your head. And if the inner critic has the stage, we really need to let the inner cheerleader have a chance to speak. Uh, the four agreements. So this is, um, so Patients, would, myself included, and patients that I work with would, you know, I'd send them, I'd teach them the seven R's. And, and then the next visit, they would say, you know, sometimes the breath just isn't enough. And then I would ask them, well, you know, give me an example. What happened? You know, give me this situation. And oftentimes I find that these two of the four agreements here, this is based on a book by Don McGill Rees, The Four Agreements. And the four agreements are be impeccable with your word, don't take anything personally, don't make assumptions, always do your best. And then he, after the four agreements, he wrote another book called The Fifth Agreement, which is to be skeptical. So I had an incident um, in my life where the breath wasn't enough, and I was really hooked or triggered by something actually that my mother-in-law said, which was that she was sick and tired of dealing with me and my mental illness. And that sent me spiraling because I really felt that she didn't know me that well because I'd only actually spent maybe 10 to 12 hours uh, with her in 10 years because of proximity, we don't live near each other. So I was really hurt and upset by that comment and I ended up calling Dr. Hughes and asking him for some help. And he basically explained to me that I had taken that comment personally. And um, so that's these are some questions you can ask yourself if you're really, triggered or hooked by something have you taken something personally and understand this quote that dr hughes had to re repeat to me at least six times because i did not get it which is other people's opinions of you are none of your business i said to him excuse me yes they are <laughs> totally my business to make you like me and he's like no chris that means that you are a people pleaser and you will be forever a puppet on a string dancing to the tune of somebody, somebody else's drumbeat about whether they like you or not. All that matters is whether you like you. And that changed my life. Of course, we all want people to like us. I mean, that's human nature. But when you want people to like you at the expense of you liking you and their opinion of you matters more than your opinion of you that is what we have to work on the second thing here is what that can trip us up is making assumptions 
I've been very guilty of this. I would, I would um, think, you know, I would mind read and I would think that people were um, perhaps saying things about me or that they thought things about me, but I never actually asked them <laughs> what they thought. I just made a whole story up in my head. So making assumptions is also a real important thing to, to ask yourself about. There's lots of other tools, and I think what I'm going to do is, because of time, I know there's so much to share. Basically, I have created a 10-week course that's based on the 10 steps that people can check out as well. But what, I'm, what I've tried to distill here into to 45 minutes to an hour is, um, is a lot. So the, last, the second to last step here is reflect every time I've stumbled with my mental health. And I have stumbled many times in the last 35 years that I've been diagnosed with, with this, um, it, is I look back, you know, what, what's going on? What happened? Which of the 10 steps did I stumble on? What happened? I think there's an explanation. So I'm proud to say that I've, you know, I've been depression free for almost a decade now completely and mania free for a decade as well. I don't, you know, I was talking earlier um, with Aubrey when we came on the call uh, about this concept of cure. And I like to believe that the experiences that I've had, the manias, I've had six psychotic episodes in 30 plus years, and I've had a, a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety. Uh, I feel that I have got to um, I've gone through those experiences in order to get to the place of healing, in order to get to the place of learning how to love and accept myself. Listen, I have just come out about being bipolar in the last year. I was still hiding that because of the shame I felt. And I didn't want anybody to know, and I wanted people to, to know me just as me. I didn't want to hear um, I didn't want people to, to think I had a mental illness. And, um, and now many people are surprised because they only know me as stable. So the last step here, which I talked about at the beginning is, um, is re well, so reward, which re relates to love. So we want to be kind to ourselves and, and we're just, we're just, most of us just aren't. So my hope is that you will start shifting towards the light, that you'll, you'll um, bring into the light these parts of you that you don't like, love, or accept. It wasn't until I shone the light of love onto the parts of myself that I didn't like, which was mostly the mania side. Um, it wasn't until I did that that I feel that I've been able to integrate that into my being, so to speak. So that is basically it. I'll just finish with just a couple things. So I want to mention this because I know that when I talk about the rephrasing of negative thoughts and I just want to mention this quote by Anita Morjani because I think it's really important for people to get this. So sweeping statements such as negative thoughts attract negativity in life aren't necessarily true and can make people who are going through a challenging time feel even worse. So using this idea indiscriminately often makes people going through seemingly tough times feel as though they are bad for attracting such events. And that's just not true. On the contrary, it actually has less to do with our thoughts than with our emotions especially what we feel about ourselves. It's also not the case that attracting positive things is simply about keeping upbeat. I can't say this strongly enough, but our feelings about ourselves are actually the most important barometer for determining the condition of our lives. So being true to ourselves is more important than trying to stay positive. So I know I've said that your thoughts can affect the neuropeptides and the cascade of hormones 
and that that is physiologically is what can happen but i don't what i what i really want people to understand is ultimately it's how you feel about you that is going to be the turning point in your health if you're at war with yourself the way i was at war with myself the way anita morjani was at war with herself you will always be at war with yourself and you're not going to feel good so start turning up the light of love in your own life i know it can be hard when you're depressed i know but know that you are love you really are so i will move to the end just because i feel that i'm going over time so just remember the foundational four steps diet sleep exercise and managing stress just start there start with start with one of those things and pick one thing that you can change and start where it feels possible for you but doing nothing is really not an option if you want to learn more and to move deeper into it, you can consider getting beyond the label. And, and I go into all of these um, areas in, in the book, or there's also the course. And then I just want you to start paying attention to where you're living, what in your mind, there's two states of being you can be in, we can be in a beautiful state of being, or we can be in a suffering state of being. And perhaps ask what are the thoughts behind the behavior? What's driving the way you're feeling from a thought perspective? And if, are there any beliefs there, perhaps? So you can't live a positive life with a negative mind. And then I'm going to just close with this poem that I wrote. So this poem came to me when I was riding my bike home from work after I learned about uh, Robin Williams committing suicide. So, and this really sums up what I've been talking about. So open, see feel believe change so open your mind open your eyes open your heart to the belief that change can happen see in your mind see in your eyes see in your heart that change happening feel through your mind feel through your eyes feel through your heart a change in belief. Open, see, feel, believe, change. All right, so there you go. I have the books that are available. There's my website, there's the course. I'm sorry I went over. <laughs> that is all right. Thank you <laughs> so much for such an informative presentation. Um, we are over, which is okay. But um, so if you have any questions, you can either contact Dr. Chris directly via the, uh, her website and the information she's giving on the slides, or you can email me, agood at ibpf.org, and send me your questions directly. And we do ask that you stay tuned. Um, we are in the process of finding time to do a presentation on the diet side of things with Dr. Yeah, yeah, so, we'll, we'll find um, time. We would love for you to join us with that. And um, we hope that you all have a wonderful day. Yeah, thank you.